Welcome to another edition of the Millennial Gems Podcast, where we highlight millennials who are not just dreaming, but are daring to challenge the status quo with their creations and their impact. And today I have a special guest, longtime brother of mine, go way, way, way back. I ain't seen him in some years, but I was able to connect with him last year when I went to ATL for the first time for InvestFest. Um, this gentleman here has been like a brother of mine, despite how many years I may have not have seen him. But again, brother alike, father, son, entrepreneur, my guy, Keelan Smith Jr. What's going on, my guy? I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be on the uh, Millennial Gems, man. You know, I'm ready to try and drop some gems and try to be a help to the people and do my service, man. I appreciate you as a brother and as an entrepreneur and as a long, 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 long time friend. Like you said, we go back to sandbox days. So <laughs> we here, man. We doing what we do. We here. Long time coming. A lot of work mm -hmm. put in. Quite a journey. Um, yeah. I just want to first start off by kind of just attacking or just talking about like what's going on currently right now with you so first just kind of just give a little brief background on who is keelan smith jr and what is he doing right now current day 2024 wow um that's a good question who is keelan smith jr keelan smith jr is a lot of things i would say i would say keelan smith jr is like you said a father um, a husband a son um, a businessman. But right now, man, from, you know, being back in Boston, I've always had a dream of becoming an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, now that I'm here doing it full time, I, I know that the dream is much more glamorous than the actual arrival. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, we have a dream of being like financially free and being, uh, you know, entirely like, you know, on our own and independent and all these other things. And then you start to realize, like, it's not about being inter independent, but it's also being about in interdependent um, because you will not you, you really don't just need you. You need your team. You need a bunch of people. Um, but to answer answer your question right now, man, I'm, I'm doing a lot of different things uh, right now. I have a coaching program I'm looking to launch. I have an ebook program I'm launching. Um, I have an app that I've been creating for quite a long time, some years that I've been putting work into. Uh, my main source of income, um, I'm self-employed, is furniture removal, jump removal, uh, furniture assembly. It, that's the main, you know, my cash cow at the moment. Um, but, you know, I have so many different things. I'm trying to do speaking engagements, all of those things. So um, when you asked me to come on the podcast, it was like, Man, this is exactly something I, I'm looking to do um, because, of course, you know, eventually I want to do my own podcast as well. So, you know, I, I think this fell right in line of what, what you're doing, like with my destiny, um, with what I'm trying to get out there. Yeah. Facts, man. Nah, okay, let's join, join the podcast game, bro. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, don't listen to what nobody say about it being oversaturated. It ain't because we all got information to share. And I don't think there'll ever be more information there i don't i don't think there will definitely be a non-excess of information that needs to be shared right regardless of the platform but first thing i wanted to kind of talk about first was uh what what is it it's called lo load up junk removal is that something yeah. you yeah. created or is that like no so with load up I, like i said i do junk removal furniture removal assembly i do like some handyman work and stuff as well and with Load Up, Load Up is just like a, a platform. It's like an app where basically it meets the customer and the contractor. So okay. me, I'm the contractor. They have customers. It's almost like the Uber for junk removal or a handyman. You know what I'm saying? It just basically will, if you go on Load Up right now, you can put a job in what you need. It'll give you a price. And then it sends it out to us. It bangs on our side of the phone. And then whichever contractor gets it first is the one that's actually able to use, uh, actually able to get the job and do the contract and, you know, follow it out and get paid for it. So right now I'm on that platform. It's one of the main platforms I work on, um, but I'm looking to expand and get on a couple of other mm -hmm. platforms, buy another truck, um, mm -hmm. looking to get into medical career stuff, also doing like routes over the road, you know, so I'm looking to kind of, with everything I do, I like to do it first. 
if I'm starting a business, I must learn it first. I must stress test it first. I must be the person that is the example. So for me, I don't really get into anything that I'm not willing to try first. Okay. And then after that, I would like to then put people in there to manage it. So my goal is now to get outside of these things I'm doing. And so I'm not always the front runner and start to hire more people and get them in position and let them make that money as I can sit back and I can continue to create and do the things I actually love to do. Because like I said, jump removal, furniture removal, assembly, it's more like a skill that I learned. It's not really something that is near and dear to my heart. It's something I learned so that I could put money on the table and I mean, so that I can put food on the table. I could continue, you know, feed my family, do the things I got to do. Because we all know when we're operating in our gift, yes, it feels amazing and it's a fun thing to do, but it doesn't always bring the money right away. So with me knowing what my gift is versus what my skills are or what can make me money right now um, or an abundance of money right now, I choose to go a little bit of a different route just so that I can, you know, move and shake and do things I need to do. Heard you. No, I, I totally agree. Um, so how 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 long do these jobs like take? Like how many or how like how many jobs can you take in a day with you know when they're being sent out? Like how many jobs are you able to fulfill in a day? Or how long um, or just how long very so it could take I have my own personal clients and then I have clients that I get to load up. So when I get my clients to load up, it could take typically I'm gonna be honest, it takes probably like 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um oh. I'm probably just made about you know, 50, 60 bucks in about 15 minutes or, you know, removing a, two nightstands and a mattress. You make like 60 bucks, you know, but load up takes their cut. So really you're supposed to make about like 120, 130, but you know, they give you about 45% of that 130 or 120. And then you take that. But if I imagine if I do five or six of those jobs and I, you know, triple, quadruple, whatever down, I'm looking at, you know, making a couple hundred, a few hundred, 400 a day. But, you know, that's always my job is to, that's always my goal is to get quantity. Because if I get a good amount of jobs in one day, it could set aside, it could put me, you know, ahead. And I don't have to necessarily worry about certain things, you know, but that's usually the goal, you know. How many jobs on average are, like, you taking, like, a day? On average, between me, like, well, for me, I could do anywhere in a week. I would say I do 12 to 15, um, and that's with me and, like, a team. It's not okay. a crazy number, but sometimes I mix it up. Like, tomorrow I have a moving job. So with my moving job tomorrow, that's, like, let's just say $65, 70 an hour. And with getting paid 65 70 an hour, I don't really need to go and trickle down on, you know, load up when I'm about to go make that type of money doing a moving job that could take four or five, six hours. And then you walk away with like three, 400 bucks, you know what I'm saying? So it just, it just varies. I do furniture delivery. Um, I do moving jobs. I do equipment delivery. I do assembly. So I do a lot of different things, but like I said, that's not even really my passion. That's just, I had some cash. I bought a cargo van for 3,500. And now that 3,500 is making me, you know, five figures, six figures, you know, depending on the year. Mm. So, you know, that's just, you know, how it goes, you know, turning that 35 into something else, you know, 10 exit, or five exit, whatever it is, you know, that, that $3,500 event, you know, kind of made a big difference for me. Word. So like, where do you bring like the, the things that people like don't want, like the junk, like when you're doing like the days, like for your picking up things from people's residences like where 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 is that stuff going uh usually to a landfill we can donate it we can sell it we're not supposed to sell it but we could sell it you know um as long as it's not on platforms where the actual companies that we contract with will be able to like see it they're okay with us you know kind of getting rid of it the the way we choose to get rid of it but a landfill um you know any type of local area Mainly land, yeah, any type of local junk landfills, place like that where you could dump your stuff, that's typically where it ends up going. Um, I choose not to keep those certain items, but a lot of the items I do get because our clients are more high middle, like upper middle class, high class clients, we yeah. typically get you know, stuff that's a, that's returns, that might be repossessions. I'm talking about $5,000 bed sets. I even got one time like a $3,000 sectional leather cup holders recliners and i ended up it was a repossession and i ended up turning around flipping it selling it maybe like a week and a half later for like 1500 on top of getting paid like 80 dollars to pick it up so 
you know, there's so much you can do, you know, with it if you really are pushing it, you know, really with all the stuff that I get, if I really wanted to take the next level, I could open up a, like a storefront and, you know, really have the items in there, almost like a liquidation warehouse in, in some sense and be selling the items from the storefront because the items that I get a lot of times are that good. Like they're good bed sets, king bed sets, queen bed sets, uh, berries, yeah. Word, bro, word. Uh, so you talked about getting into coaching. Now, what what type of coaching are yeah you know, like are you looking to like explore? Like, I'm certified in life coaching uh, through a program. I I have not, I haven't really dove into the life coaching as much. Um, I'm certified in life coaching, but I also want to do business coaching just with startups. Um, mm. I believe that we can only teach, and I posted that like probably earlier today or yesterday. I really believe that we can only teach what we've experienced. Uh, as far as like at least getting somebody's money. If you want to give some advice in your empath, in your empath, that's a different story, you know, because certain things we feel, but we might not actually experience. So we can understand the feeling, but we might not understand the experience. But as far as like what I'm teaching uh, for startups, um, you know, my goal is to help people get their business started. Um, you know, get into the game, write your business plan, plan out your business, uh, learn different ways to create uh, to have creative funding for your business, whether you're trying to do a pitch deck and pitch to pe pitch to investors, capital ventures, all of those diff different type of things. Um, there's so many different ways that you can make money, uh, the SBA loans and all these type of places that there's resources for people who have startups. So my goal is to help you refine a plan, you know, make sure you know what you're talking about, help you get pitch ready, and then to help you start going and walking through these doors. One of my clients right now, actually is in a program for Babson College where they're looking to receive, you know, anywhere between 2,500 to like 20,000 or more or something like that. And they made it through like the first two phases and now they're on to the last phase of actually pitching their uh, executive summary and then seeing if they qualify for the funding. So we, we, we've gotten pretty far. Word, bro. And I'm um, like, I have the utmost confidence that you're going to excel at this and you. you're going to be the, the best at it um speaking of you know being able to pitch uh you know somebody's product or service mm. i want to talk about you being the winner of the real entrepreneur yeah, show let's go um to be honest i had no i i've never heard it to show up until I had seen you post it on social media. So kind of just talk about like, you know, your experience on there, how the experience came up and like, you know, what are just like some of like the challenges and things that you've learned being on that show? Yeah. So um, basically it's called the Real Entrepreneur Show. Um, it's by a guy, his name is uh, Dr. Casual Pitch. Shout out to him. Um, he's an amazing entrepreneur. He has about 18 businesses, um, you know, that he's involved in right now. He's also a serial like investor and invest in, he has his own hedge fund. He does real estate, mm -hmm. investing in startups and all types of different things. So, um, he's just multifaceted, very versatile entrepreneur, um, African-American from New York. Now he lives in Atlanta, well, not Atlanta, but I think it's Columbus, Georgia, but it's his show and, um, he's independent. And he was just like looking to start his own show, throwing out auditions on Facebook saying, hey, you know, um, who wants 100000 for their business? I said, who doesn't want 100000 for their business? <laughs> you know, he's like, Jeez. you know, what, what entrepreneur would like to make 100000 for their business, or at least try to? And um, he's like, we have auditions for a show that I'm starting up. And he also does this thing called the Real Entrepreneur Award. So he also does that where you get to receive funds too if you win and you're nominated and all those things. And I was just like, man, let me go try. And I was about to go to Miami, um, hang out for some leisure time with family and friends. And then I went straight to the audition. When I went to the audition, I answered some questions. None of it had to do with my personal business. I think that was the coolest part about it is, is it's not necessarily about your own personal business. It's about you as an entrepreneur, and what type of work you've put in, what type of space you're in, or how far you've come in your journey. A lot of the times when you start up a business, I, I know you know, 
everything is almost done on your own. Anybody who started and didn't get money just thrown in their hand or, right. you know, invested right away, you start off doing everything on your own. And this is exactly what the show is about what we go through on our own trying to build our business, whether it's making your own website, making your own flyers for marketing, um, whether you are creating uh, your own financial plan and trying to figure out how you're going to 10x a thousand dollars and make a thousand, ten thousand, um, or even make a Or even turn like you know ten thousand into uh, turn a hundred thousand into a million. So it's all of those things. So it, it it becomes like when you when I looked at the show. I mean, when I heard about it, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I knew that I was like, man, this is something. I I need some money. I need to stop. I want to start my business on the right you know track. So I didn't want to use it for the junk removal or anything like that. If I were to win at that time, even though now everybody knows I'm the winner, mm -hmm. but at the time I didn't want to use it for junk removal. Cause like I said, that's just something I do to make money. Um, I wanted to use it for something else I'm more passionate about. So, you know, I have other tech ideas that I've started up that I'm passionate about, and I'm just really passionate about helping and helping people and being a disruptor. That's my goal. I want to be the Ubers. I want to be the Facebooks. I want to come in where, you know, there's something already kind of going and change the whole dynamic of how it looks and how it feels and, and give it a new look and a new feel and take it to the next level, take it to the nations. So, um, you know, I have a, a company called Smart Compart that um, that I actually am going to use the money that I want from the show to invest into. But um, with the show, man, we had to do things like, I don't know if you've seen any episodes, but we had to do some things like uh, create a marketing flyer in one hour. So they'll tell us, this is the business. Here's the owner of the business. Here's our model. Here's our website. Go. Go. Wow. That's it. Kind of just uh, just, just give you the, the task and kind Go. of just they'll give us the, the fire to get it they'll done. They'll say Canva, or we're using Canva, or we're using this, or we're using that. But at the end of the day, you got to go do what you do. You entrepreneur, you have you had to make flyers? Do you outsource that? What type of things have you done? Um, they had us make websites. They'll say, you know, yo, here's a website, blah, 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 go. And, you know, we have to ask the questions we need, you know, to get the answers on. And then we just got to flow through it. So it's it was one of those things, man, where the pressure was on. But like I said, I've been in entrepreneurship. The greater part of about six years now, since about two since about 2007, I've had my LLC. I've been Heard. hustling way before that. You know, I've been hustling since like when I was 20, you know, whatever, <laughs> 10 years. So, you know, but at the end of the day, shit, hustling since 20, hustling since like 17, man. You know, selling belts, selling clothes, selling I whatever, you know, I've been hustling. But as far as, you know, legitimate entrepreneurship um, and having like, you know, certifications and stuff, I started about in 2017. So yeah, man, I've I've done all all the groundwork that people could say they you know they've had to do on their own. I I feel like I've done. Do you feel like there were like there was anything while you were on that show that you was just like, damn, this is this is really making me like uncomfortable. Like this is really like a challenge for me to to yeah. achieve or like a task achieve. Like yeah. what what was like? Because like honest, I I'll be honest, I haven't seeing the show all the way through like now that it's done like now i'd like to go back and kind of just like you know binge watch it mm -hmm. you know to kind of just really just get it one after because i mean i'm pretty good about you know I, I like anticipation but it was just one of those things where i was just like nah i, I actually kind of just want to see this from start to finish with you know one after the other um when you know once once it kind of finishes out but yeah just like what were like some of like the the struggles are like challenges that you kind of face during, you know, like each episode, or if there was like an episode where they gave you a task and you was just like, damn, this is really yeah. tough. Um, like this is, this is going to drive me up I the wall say, trying to get the toughest part would be uh, the time frame and where we were creating the show. Um, we were supposed to have a longer time frame, and then we kind of shortened it like half, cut it in half the time frame that we were going to use. Mm. So, Really, we were running off of like two to three hours during filming. So 
try to operate your brain on the highest level. I mean, thinking numbers, thinking creative ideas, making an executive summary in an hour about a business that you just learned about. You know what I'm saying? That for me, luckily I've done pitch decks. I've done these type of things where I was pitching at Harvard Business Program. I pitched at Babson College before I was even coaching somebody to pitch through Babson College. So I've done these things where I've, I've been under the pressure. I've been writing business plans and executive summaries. That's not anything new to me, but it's just the 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 type of pressure you're under when you have a camera on you and you're looking at other right. people around you. You have to hone in and really focus and be like, listen, man, I'm, I'm about to you know kill this. Like, there's nothing else to can't worry about nobody else. Don't look at nobody else's board. Don't look at anything that's going on around you because at the end of the day, the focus is on what you, if you don't know what you have in here or in here, it, you're not going to win for real. Yeah. And that's what mm-hmm. I noticed was a lot of people were really sometimes not really focused on, you know, what they had in here, but what was going on around them. And mm-hmm. you know, that will take away from it. But I would say the hardest part was definitely, getting, you know, executive summaries, man, for brand new businesses, brand new ideas. One of the challenges um, and this challenge actually, I think got cut from filming, but it was a challenge that we had to do where we had to create a business from the ground up and it had to be totally innovative, totally new. And we had to make an executive summary for it, executive um, for business, business executive summary for it. And, um, we only had like an hour, you know, and they gave us a little bit of room, you know, to wiggle, but we only had an hour to do it, man. And I had to completely think of something that hasn't been done. Um, and because that didn't air, I'll tell you, like, at that time I came up with like a, it was like a, I think it was like a, it was called I, I and F or if the if uh, machine. And I came up with like an iron and fold machine. If you're, if you're into like the, the tech space right now, there is a, a steamer. A, 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 it's almost like a vending machine, but it's a steamer. And you could put your clothes in there and it'll just steam and it'll get all the wrinkles out. Mm. So I said, how do I take that to the next level? That's, that's the only thing I could think. I had to think of something so abstract that people aren't thinking about or doing. I'm like, how do I take this to the next level? So I just said, how about I add, you know, a folding element to it where when it's on the rod, instead of it just, you know, steaming and then you take it out, what if you had 10 pieces of clothing and each item would kind of swivel down and fold automatically. Swivel down, fold automatically. Swivel down. Oh, that'd be fold. kind of lame. That's kind of actually kind of lit. <laughs> so then, who, now, but who's your target market for that? Moms, you know, people who are wives, people who are working a lot, you know, all of those different things. So we have to go through all of those. We have to do the SWOT analysis, threats, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So I had to literally sit there an hour after I thought of the product. I had to think of, all right, how is this going to work? Who's my competitors? Who is this? Where does this, what's my target market? Yeah, man. What's our mission? What's our vision? And, you know, and it just, that was probably the toughest one right there. That was probably the toughest one. Um, how was it? Cause I know I, I thought I seen like a, like a clip or like part of like an episode where you had, where there was like a, I guess like a team element. Um, so how kind of just quickly like touch on like what it's like having to work with kind of just like teammates to help bring a project to life. Mm, one second. Man, I think that was probably like the funnest one at first. Um, because again, it was in a space that I was already familiar with. On um, the first episode, they said we had to do it again, um, create a business from the ground up. But as a team, I, I'm familiar with the pitch space. You know, when we had to kind of get the team together, I, I like to observe first, man. I, I sit back and I listen. I like to hear people. I like to respect other people's time and energy because everybody has the right to speak on what they feel is, you know, in, in them. And, you know, at first I let everybody ponder on what it is that we should do or what type of business mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. And then I was just like, man, this is what I think we should do. This is what I think how it should go. This is actually what I do. And, you know, once I started speaking, they were listening so heavily that I ended up becoming the team lead. And I just kind of gave all the direction on where we should go, how we should do it, you know, how this should be formatted. And that was actually one of the first challenges. And that was the first challenge we won. Every time we won a challenge, we would actually get $100 for each challenge. 
So they would give you a hundred dollars right there in your hand, boom, as soon as you won. Oh. That first challenge actually is what helped me because on the show, I actually do end up on the chopping block maybe about two, three times or about three times um, before I actually win. And the chopping block just means we're like the last two or three people to kind of get saved. And I was wow, on you? That. Wow, okay. Yeah. I was on there about, I, I made silly mistakes, man. Silly mistakes. Okay. You know, making the same mistake over and over again, it just means you're not really, you know, paying attention or, mm -hmm. you know, you're rushing or whatever it may be. And that's what I ran into, just making the kind of same redundant mistake. And they were just like, we have to put you in the bottom two or three because you're continuously doing the same thing. So, you know, that's what landed me there. But, uh, man, that first challenge, yeah, leading the team was, was, it was, I would say it's easy. Being a team leader is, is different, um, you know, but at, I would say every day I'm like a team leader, you know, um, when it comes to having a family, being in these circumstances, um, you know, every day you have to provide as a man. So that's, that's what I'm used to at this point, um, is being a team leader, being a father, um, you know, every day or every week is like a project or whatever it may be. Um, as far as being a team lead man on projects, it's something I'm used to just for multiple reasons. For one, like I said, I'm a husband, a father. So every day, every week, you know, it's like a project, um, you know, trying to get your kids to school, trying to get the homework done, trying to make sure the bills are paid, trying to get work done, trying to make sure you still have time for them. So, you know, I have to be very uh, meticulous and uh, very detailed about my day or my time and my efforts. Now, on the other side, I did ministry for the, I would say about four or five years straight when I first moved to Atlanta. Which I was actually going to get ready to get into to kind of take yeah. you back, you know, before we yeah, kind of got you to Atlanta. That's, um, that's that part right there, man. Um, I did ministry and when you do ministry and you have a real heart for God, sometimes, you know, you put yourself in a space that you never knew you'd be in. Um, you know, I ended up doing like youth ministry and I um, was leading a team and doing all these things for the greater part of free. Oh, you know, that's just the service type of heart I had um, when it came to serving. You know, anybody who's been in ministry, they know what that looks like, how that feels, what it is. But, you know, one thing I could say it does is it helps you learn a lot of, you know, things that could, it helps you learn and maneuver in real life situations because you're dealing with real life people. But a lot of people look at ministry as just something all oh, extra spiritual and extra, you know, God, this and God. But when you get in the midst of it, it's just like an everyday business. You know what I'm saying? You have to be organized. You have to schedule your meetings. You have to be on top of things. You have to look the part, play the part, be the part. Um, especially if somebody has their church at a certain level, whether you have like 500 members, you know, a thousand mm -hmm. members, whatever it is. And our church is at that level where we have, you know, a revolving door of about a couple thousand members, you know, you start to learn what it looks like to have to lead people through life in certain ways. And, um, you know, that helped prep me for, you know, leading a team too, as well. So this was, so when, when did you start getting into the 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 ministry life that was it you said five six years now or 27 from 2016 all the way until about 2001 i want to say 2020 2000 i was in ministry yeah i was um okay. i was full-time in ministry for like four years four or five years so yeah once i got in i was all the way in i was i was going in bro but i was um, i was doing like maintenance facilities and that was like how i got paid you know i got paid because I would do cleaning, I would do fixtures. So even what I do now with load up has to do with my background. You know, I got yeah. paid at the church to clean and fix things and put up fluorescent light bulbs and do light fixtures and all set up and break down for events. So I had all of that experience just from that job. And then I did youth ministry because I had a heart and passion for the next generation that's coming up, you know? So my goal was like, while I'm doing, how can I get paid through this? But also, how can I affect the next generation? How can I be a help? How can I serve? And um, that's why I felt like I was, you know, going to be my best at. Because, you know, when you have a kid at 16 and life forces you to kind of do things differently, that's where, you know, you feel, that's where I felt like my message came in. You know, that's where I feel like my example came in. Like, 
yeah, I have my kid at 16, but there's a lot of things I can teach you on what not to do. You might not, you don't have to be like me or be the example that I am from that point in life. I want you to know that this is what you shouldn't do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, these are the things you need to watch out for. Because, you know, in high school, man, they don't teach us a lot of life skills that we should learn. Right. So, you know, that was my goal was like, as these kids are in high school, they're in middle school. I did all the way from like, I think kindergarten all the way to high school. You know, I, I was over like the whole thing at that point. So, you know, I was just like, I, I want to, you know, give them the right message and the right idea of what it looks like, you know? Word. Um, so actually kind of, once again, like you, honestly, you, you're doing like a great job, like kind of like <laughs> beating me to like pause, get into the, <laughs> the segments that I'm trying to actually like get into. Um, yeah. Cause I was literally going to ask next, like kind of just take me back to life before Atlanta, before you mm. even get to Atlanta, like man, kind of just get through, you know, like 16, you know, you get, you get through. Cause I, I, I haven't seen you since what that was 2000. That was fifth grade. I think was the last time I seen you. Yeah. And that was like 2004 or five, I think. Yeah. So kind of just from like, Six, pretty much go from like 16, I guess, or like from like high school up until um, you get to, you decide to make the transition to Atlanta. Like kind of just talk about the journey between that time and he's okay. like, journey, the struggles, like what, what were you going through around like that time period? Okay. So in high school, of course, you know, I'm born and raised in Boston, uh, Mattapan, shout out Mattapan, Six, one, seven, you forever. know it. You know, matter of fact, however, you know, it. <laughs> once six, you know what we doing, man. Stop that. Threes, we, we out here. Um, door the guy, so that's just, you know. You know, it's, it's, it's all love. We right He's here just, next door. No, door yeah, yeah. We, we all same part, Mary. but you know, everybody claim they own. Yeah, do it. Who, who's the hardest? It's just like, it's just like New York. Like, you know, it's just yeah. everybody claims their own borough. That's just how it is over here, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. but no, uh, man, at 16... I had my uh my son, my first one, right now three kids, but I had my son in um, you know, high school. I was dating the same girl from like seventh grade all the way like through high school. We was on and off. It wasn't like, you know, we were consistently together the whole time, but you know how it is, man. High school sweethearts, you know, all of that cool stuff. And you I know, thought I had it. Up, you said I thought I, I thought <laughs> I had know, it sparked in the boss. Have... It sparked in the ball seventh grade and then it kinda it went its way, you know, freshman year and then it kinda just went downhill and then it was just two years of just really just trying to figure out and just this is probably the part of my life where i just really learned that yo that i realize now you i can't be a sucker like that ever again like you don't never this is this oh, yeah. this is when I, this is when i learned like now 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 looking back at it i was just like this is why i don't i will never be attached to another woman again no, like can't say that. 14 to like 18, bro. And I tell you, like, I had never felt like that about a girl ever. And like, mm -hmm. it literally took me down a rabbit hole. Like, it took me until I got to this podcast. She knows exactly who she's who, who, who I'm talking about. Some <laughs> other people may know who I'm talking about as it's well. Smoke. It's not but it's, smoke, it's just like, man. it was just like that long time. It was that, it was that long. Like, it, it took me a minute to get over her, like, all the way up until freshman year when I'm finally exposed to, you know, a bunch of other girls. And I'm like, I'm not hanging around her anymore. And I'm like, you know what? Yo, why am I stressing about this? Right. Here I am, the other girl. I know what so. type of guy you are, man. Once you get your eyes on something, you're focused and you're locked in, you just the type of guy just don't give up. You know? No, so no. I, I know. But you know, what's funny? you know what the funny thing is? In seventh grade, when, we, when she came to the school, I wasn't interested in her. Mm. She was interested in me. Already, I was, I was already working. I was already She's working magic with some He's other like, girl already. Like it. I had, I, I, I already had interested. another play already in motion already. It was just like she started to like me, and it's like it made sense. Like as time went, because I'm like the other girl that I was dating. It was like she lived out in like Randolph, and I'm 12 years old. I'm like I'm not going out to Randolph to see this shorty every day or every weekend. But I got a girl who likes me. And I see her five days a week. Right. So eventually over time, I just was just like, you know, shoot, I'll just make this. I'll, I'll do this instead. And, you know, I tried to keep it on the low for some time. But, you know, 
once again, you know, somebody had to go ahead and spill the beans and it was just, it was just hell up. It was just a lot of up and downs from that point on. Just, just madness. I don't even want to get into it or relive it again. Uh -huh. but this, this is what I mean by like, I will not like, you would think as guys, you're supposed to have the confidence to just move on and like, but I just could not do it. I could not shake the feeling. I wanted this to work so bad. And that's the thing about me. Like, I'm always going to go to the absolute fullest and fully exhaust everything I can to make something work yeah. before I just completely quit. That's me. And like, it was just, I kept doing it. And I was like, I was trying to hang on to something that wasn't there. Mm. And so like, that killed me up until like, I got to like college where I was like, you know what? This is, well, this. I can't, I can't continue man. on like this. So that's something about your character, you know, that shows that you are devoted, man. You are loyal beyond uh, measure, you know? And that's, that's one of the issues that I think a lot of us uh, suffer from, man, is we don't know when to draw the line or when to kind of like, cut it off sometimes you know and right. um that's almost like a trait of most entrepreneurs you know when we find something we're passionate about or you know that's in our heart or in our mind it's almost like we don't stop until it comes to fruition and um you know that's what it's been like for a lot of my ideas or businesses that i have now um you know i have like i said with the app and everything that i do have man all these ideas and stuff that i've been working on for like three four years you know what i'm saying it's not stuff I just wake up and you know pop out it's like I think about it I plan it I grab investors I figure out ways to get it you know to fruition and then you know I think the hardest part that I probably suffer with overall is just the execution of actually pushing the product out and I think that's the hardest part for all of us is we don't necessarily have the plan for the execution on how we're going to push our product out and um, we like to push it out but we don't necessarily look at all the facets and what a business needs. Because if you're not branding and marketing your business, then how do we really have a sustainable business? Because we right. have to get it in front of a certain amount of eyes. It just, it just, oh, yeah, it just needs to be just out there, just period for it. Even, even look to make a sale on anything. It just has to yeah. be out there. And like, I, yeah. I know I've had more than enough instances where I'm like, I have something working and i'm like all right well i'm gonna wait for the right time to put it out it's not ready yet and just kind of just keep pump faking on you know things ideas that i've had and i'm like you know what is i keep waiting for the right time i ain't never gonna get it out there and i ain't gonna right. i ain't gonna make no money so right. it was just like the product ain't, it ain't it ain't gotta be perfect like i'll i'll learn along you know i'll enjoy the journey i'll put it out if it sucks right now all right cool that's just feedback that i gives me more time to work on the product and right make it better and you know more um what's the word i want to use make it more uh i'm having a brain fart on the word well anyway making people want to actually buy into my product i don't know why i'm forgetting what the word is but mm. anyway um sorry I didn't, I didn't mean to distract you on kind of your journey getting to atlanta bro because i i just had to I had to get that right, out real good. quick, you know. You so, good? I know. But anyway, I yeah, know you can go and continue. Like. But like, yeah, so you pretty much uh, how you got to Atlanta, Atlanta. like what led up to the, the move to Atlanta. So, like I said, at that point, I think I was at baby mama drum. Man, we, was, we were dating for from seventh grade on. We end up having, uh, she ends up getting pregnant when we're like 16 or so, 15, something like that. I ended up having my son a month before I took I had my son a month before I turned to, uh, that, that right there lit a fire in my eyes. I'm not going to lie, man. You know, that like was, you know, the part that kind of changed the trajectory of my life. You know, you, I feel like when we're without kid or when we don't have anybody depending on us, if you don't really just have a diehard passion, like what you were saying, that sometimes because the way America markets, marks life to us, it markets certain things to us on the front end but it mm -hmm. doesn't give us the back end on what comes with that. So they market marriage to us, but they don't tell you how to sustain a relationship. They market business to us, like be a business or work, you know, work for somebody, uh, be a business owner, but they don't, you know, teach you how to, you know, prepare your taxes or how to, you know, go out there and market, you know, do you, are you gonna do guerrilla marketing? Are you gonna do social media marketing? You know, there's so many different ways to do it, 
Um, they don't teach you how to advertise your business and marketing, advertising, two different things. So it's it's like you get all the fun and glamour of what everything looks like. Great America, come here, do this. But then you don't really learn. You have to go through it to learn what it takes unless you just end up finding a great mentor. And, um, yeah. you know, I feel like that's what a lot of my life has been is, you know, chasing after those things up front and then learning on the back end. Okay, let's retract and regroup and and really make this what it's supposed to be. You know, at 16, I ended up just, man, saying, forget everybody, forget all of this. Like, I had to look around and realize these people ain't here for me. Like, you know, as far as my friends, we're cool, it's fun, and our relationship is entertaining. But at the end of the day, I have a kid on the way, and I need to change my lifestyle. So at that point, I jumped into um, a dual enrollment program. It was a program where basically you could go to college and earn high school credits while you earn both at the same time. So I was earning college credits and high school credits at a community college. Right. And the crazy part about this program is called Gateway to College. You don't have to be an academic scholar. You have to explain to them why you feel like you should be in college and why you feel like you should leave high school. That's it. You pay like $150 back then. I'm talking 2012, 2011. In 2011, Gateway to College would allow you to get into college through this scholarship program as long as you can explain why you no longer want to be in high school. And so you pretty time. much are like give like you could pretty much kind of like buy your way out of high school. Interesting. That's yeah. Wow. And I paid 150 or 200 wow. bucks and they were like, write an essay to us. And I wrote my essay. My essay was I'm about to have a kid. I feel like my life is going to be different. I feel like I'm set apart from everybody else. I don't want to be in the same trajectory as everybody. Freshmen are coming in. I don't want to be distracted by the freshmen. I want to take my senior year serious. And my senior year, I was able to accept the means of the program. And that year, I was able to go into the dual enrollment program, be in community college a year earlier than the time I was supposed to even graduate. And then I actually finished that program and was able to get both college and high school credits. And right. yeah, after that, after that, I started working two jobs. I was at McDonald's and the Boys and Girls Club and this and that. Look, like doing anything I could do, man, to kind of get ahead. Um, because I realized at that point was I forced myself at it. You know, when you go from being a young adolescent, not even really, you know, just becoming an adolescent at 17, you, I, can't, I couldn't afford to do the things everybody else was doing. So, you know, that's Dude, kind of been my Forced push. to grow up faster than everybody else. Jeez. Yeah, that's my, that's been my push, man. Um, you know, then after that, man, pitch, like I said, pitch programs, college, uh, you know, getting straight A's, doing stuff. And I also had a lot of failures. Those are the good things that happened, but. A lot of failures, man. I mean, I started college and dropped out maybe like two or three times, two or three different colleges, started so many businesses, lost so much money doing business, made a lot of money doing business. I mean, you know, it's granted, you know, give or take, it's whatever you want to focus on the journey. But um, getting to Atlanta was more of a spiritual journey for me. When I was in Boston, uh, things started to click differently for me. I don't know if you've ever read um, Thinking Grow Rich. Or Absolutely, one of literally the first books I picked up. I feel when... like that's everybody's first book. Like it was literally the f actually eh, no, I think it, was, I think it was. It might have been like my, my. It might have been second or third in line actually because I had already knew like twenty twenty, like I had already kind of had the idea in my mind. I was like, let's see, twenty nineteen. I just I just turned twenty five, so I had already made in my mind like when twenty twenty starts. I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna be doing the same. You gotta focus and get your life right now. Yeah. So for me, my first one of my first books was Napoleon Hill. And um I started reading the book with Napoleon Hill, Laws yep. of Success. Right there. And with that book, man, it changed my whole thinking. And one of the reasons why I changed my mind too was because I didn't understand a lot of things in the book. So when I had to understand it, it, it put me in a different position. It was like, whoa. You know, when you're reading something and you constantly have to go to a dictionary or you constantly have to go to Google, that means you might be in the right space. But sometimes it gets overbearing, overwhelming having to do that. But 
reading that book was one of those things I had to continuously go on Google, continuously go in the dictionary and be like, yo, what is he talking about? And one of the things that stuck out to me the most was the natural affinity. How you have the natural capability with your energy, your body, mm -hmm. your spirit is naturally attracted to certain types of people. And um, it doesn't mean like there's anything, you know, we use the word now as chemistry, um, but also it can be called an affinity, A-F-F-I-N-I-T-Y, -I, I believe, if I'm correct. And um, that stuck out to me because I started to realize a lot of people that I had that natural affinity on that chemistry with um, when I didn't even know them. You know, those people you meet and you are like-minded and you guys kind of in the same space in life and kind of, you know, moving at the same trajectory. And, you know, I, I was just like, wow, like this, it, I, now I, I know what these things are. I'm starting to sense it. And I feel like once we know, that's kind of what changes the game. So I read that book and then I called my father who's in ministry and does business and he's a serial entrepreneur as well. And I just said to him, you know, although I, I wasn't born, raised with him, um, he's living in Atlanta. I'm living in Boston at the time. I just said, hey, Dad, I kind of want to do business. Like, what does that look like? How does that work? And he said, well, son, you need a plan. He said, the first thing you need is a plan. He's like, you're going to start a business, and what, what is it going to be about? Where is it going to be? You know, who are you going to work with? What what type of management are you going to have? Like, he's like, you know, you need a plan. He's like, so write this plan. Mind you, I'm 16. I'm like, I had a plan. Like, what? I'm talking about making money. I need to make money. How do I make a, a, a successful business? You made million dollar business. How do I do it? He says, make a plan and I'll check in with you in a week. So he gave me um, another shameless plug, LawDepot.com. You know, it's like plug and play. When you use Law Depot, you, they ask you all the questions. They prep your contracts. Everything is already formulated for you. And you just basically plug and play. So it'll ask you, when do you want to start your business? Where is it going to be located, et cetera? And uh, that changed everything for me. I After that, I knew, man, I got to learn how to plan. I got to learn. I got to know everything before it's even here. Um, and it's like what they say in ministry, without vision, people, the people perish. No, you have to be able to share the vision. And a lot of the times we fail or we misstep or we fall off because we didn't plan the vision before we pursued it. That is the biggest issue with a lot of us, especially African-American businesses. We don't even know where our business is going. We don't know how much money we want to make next year. We didn't keep track records of our financial statements. We don't know, you know, what dollar amount we're looking to raise in funds. We right. don't have any of those things set out. So, um, you know, once I got into that game, that's what, you know, set me on the trajectory. And um, my father started encouraging me to move to Atlanta. I started seeing license plates that said Georgia out of nowhere. I started hearing people talk about Georgia out of nowhere. And I think the biggest obstacle was that me and the mother of my child, we weren't even together at the time. You know, we mm -hmm. had been together since seventh grade. So at that point, I had to convince her to move. And then the funny part is when I asked her to move, she was like, we're not together. Like, what? why would I leave with you to another state? She laughed in my face. Everybody <laughs> laughed in my face. But guess what happened, man? When, God, when it's God's will, it'll be done. A month later, she's having issues at work. She no longer likes the place she lives. She no longer likes who she lives with. She takes a private trip to Atlanta without even telling me because she wanted to work for BET and do PR stuff and do uh, journalism and all that. And a month later, she circles back and says, yo, that what you're talking about with Atlanta, is that still on the table? And I said, what? Word. And I was like, yes, yeah, on the table. Like, what's up? And lo and behold, we ended up, I drove out there. She flew out there and I drove 16 hours, man, just to be here doing what I'm doing now, be a business owner, um, you know, do ministry, change lives, impact lives, um, you know, serve God, serve people. And um, we hear that, man. We hear. What a journey, bro. What a journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. Quickly, uh, just kind of talk about the, I know you mentioned something about a smart compart. Yeah. Smart compart. Now, this is your company brand brand right yeah smart compart is my newest startup venture um i have a couple of startup ventures right now i have a startup venture called goals app.net 
So yes, we, do, we can also touch on that as well. I, I know you, I remember you showing me that when I was there. I have goalsapp.net and then I have Smart Compart LLC. This is where my tech side comes in where I start to think in, you know, in a different way. Um, with Smart Compart, it is short term um, rentals almost for lockers. So we know we have storage units, we have vending machines, all those type of things. Um, Smart Compart is basically going to fall into almost like that storage uh, space where you're able to store smaller personal items inside of a locker for a short period of time or a long period of time. And you can become a mem a monthly member. You can become, a, you can just rent for an hour. You can rent for 10 minutes or whatever it may be. And, uh, well, more like an hour. We'll do. I was about to say, I was like 10 hour. minutes. <laughs> I was like, I'm not thinking. <laughs> right, right. I was like, yeah, it's a stretch. But that was on the table. Like at the end of the day, we're still formulating the whole thing. But at the end of the day, um, you can rent for an hour. You can rent for a day. You can rent for a week, whatever it may be. The idea is imagine you're at an airport and you're running behind on schedule. You get to check in. And when you get to check in, they tell you your bag is overweight. What do we usually do with our stuff when our bag is overweight? We try to put it on this. We try to take it out, put it in another bag, give it to somebody mm -hmm. else. I've even heard of people having to throw away some of the stuff that they've had to take, supposed to take yeah. to check in. And um, we end up losing possession of good items that we could have kept that's just maybe one or two pounds over because now they want to charge $100. Well, my goal is to have a smart compart locker there at an airport. Um, whether it, or at an amusement park or at a water park or at a courthouse that doesn't allow phones. All of these places, this is where a smart compart could come in and save your day. So, um, you know, my goal was always to get into the, the space of, you know, residual income, the income I can earn without having to physically work, because that's what I do mm -hmm. now. I trade time for money. But I want to get into the space where I don't have to trade the time for money. So, you know, that is where the short-term rental idea came in. It's one of those simple ideas, but impactful. It's almost like how Uber steals you steals the taxi cab job by just saying everybody can be a taxi cab driver. You know what I'm saying? So now it's like, I don't want you to just think about storing your stuff, big items in your house. I want people to work now be able to store the smaller items that are on their body or in their pocket. And those and that's where that idea came from. And then as far as like the goals app that you've how how long have you had that? You've had that for like quite some time now. Because I yeah. remember when you talked Those about it, you apps, said you was in like it was still in beta when you. I took multiple because it took multiple routes. With Goals app, I started off wanting to do it the traditional way with coding and all of that, and then I found out about another route that I could take with this company called. I don't I don't really remember the name. I think it's like Make, but I could be wrong, so I don't even want to say that. But it's a company where basically they do all the coding for you. And they give you just the interfaces that you can work with. And you have engineers still, even for the interfaces, because they're kind of complicated. But um, you basically could develop your own app without mm -hmm. having to code yourself. And um, that is where I was able to get on that and develop this app for like $1,000 in one week, $1,500 in one week. And um, we all know coding, it, a, an app from the ground, it could take a year or years, depending on how complex it is. Um, and it took me a while to find people to invest in all some stuff. So I just said, man, forget this. I'm gonna take a loan out. I'm gonna fund my own stuff. And I did it that way, man. I took out a loan. I bet on myself. Um, I haven't really launched it, launched it, you know, but I, I'm still in pre-launch where I have people on there stress testing it and playing around on it. And, you know, I'm still developing the product. But once I feel like it's totally ready, my goal is to launch it hopefully at the top of the at the end of this year. Oh, word, okay. Good timeline to have. Yeah, man. Um, you have an ebook coming out. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. What right? is what is this ebook you got coming out, and what do you hope people gain from reading this ebook? Man, I do have an ebook coming out. It is about personal development, man. Self check for us. Um, you know that's one of the things I talked about on my journey. A lot of the times, I realized that. The reason why I might have got ahead of certain people was because I was always self-checking myself. Um, I always checked in with me. I always analyzed me. And um, I didn't wait for somebody else to give me their analogy on who I am. I've always given myself my own analogy on who I am and where I should go. And I thank my parents and, you know, my family for that, giving me that confidence and, you know, really supporting me. Um, but I've always analyzed who I am. And I think a lot of times 
we can go a long way without really checking in with ourselves, whether it's patient, whether it's really just figuring out what gives you that fire. Um, you know, I, one of my new sayings that I, I made of myself is, you know, life is just a bunch of sparks um, and it could be good sparks or bad sparks, but you have to figure out what makes you hot and could turn into that fire almost. And yeah. we don't really pay attention to the sparks we have. And one thing I learned was that I'm a good teacher. I'm a good speaker. And that was one of my sparks to the point where I was getting paid to do it when it was, when I was in ministry, when I was getting paid to do it, just to talk to a high school or um, some kids in high school and stuff like that. So I paid attention to those sparks until I started to catch on fire a little bit. And um, this ebook is just going to be about that, man. You know, what is it? What is your spark? Who are you? Um, how do you speak to yourself? How do you um, learn about yourself? What are the steps you're taking? And I will give some of the steps that I've taken um, in the ways that I've learned about myself to the point that I'm at now where, you know, I, I've raised, you know, the 25,000 and 75,000 resources for my new business. And I've invested in myself for so many years with other businesses. And I made six figures, you know, a couple of years ago in my business and all of these different things. And, um, you know, just kind of share, you know, the, some of the steps and little secrets that, you know, got me there. Some of the gems, you know, my millennial gems. That's, telling that's the people, book. man, it the game out. changing generation, telling people stop sleeping. Like, yo, yeah. we got the answers. Like we done been through the most shit, but we, we, we've adapted to the most shit also. Like we, we yeah, have the answers. Yeah, like, you already we, know. We're changing the game. We're the one innovating. Like we're leading the pack. So it's just, you know, it's up to us to make sure that we're the ones who are taking, taking lead of, you know, making sure that the the next generations are, you know, their their set blueprint. Yeah, man, and that's um, it comes out May twentieth, May twentieth. So you know, that's my birthday. You know, that's when I turned the big thirty. So I wanted to do it, you know, different. I wanted to do it big. And I said, man, let me drop an ebook on my birthday, man. Let me oh, yeah. help some people. Let me share who I am. Let me give a little bit more to the world. So that's my my thing, man. A lot of times we want to receive on our birthday, but for me, I was like, man. I want to give something away. So, you know, my goal is on that day to hopefully give away some books and then also be able to, um, you know, have a bunch of people buy it, man, and learn more about themselves and learn more about me. Yeah, that's the goal. Word. Hey, brother, I appreciate you for doing this. Talk with me about your journey, all the adventures again, that man. you got going on. Yeah. I appreciate you doing this. And, you know, I hope you, I, well, I, I don't, I know you want to have the success that you're looking for with all you have dreamt up and all that you have in motion right now. Um, kind of just let audience know like where they can find you, you know, and you know, where to find like the ebook, anything you got going on. Um, kind of just let us know where to find you and how to get in contact with you about anything hey, and everything. You Facebook, I appreciate you, man. I thank you. Um, it's been an honor being on your platform, and I know this is going to be something that keeps growing, and you're going to keep showing up and keep performing. And, uh, man, I, I just can't wait till we, we do this again, and it's on a whole different level. But um, Oh, yeah. No, I believe mean, me. I, I, yeah. Waiting for the day when I can when I can get my, my, <laughs> my studio together, bro. Believe me. Yeah. It's, 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 it's coming. It's, my, it's coming. You already got it. Um, but you can find me on Instagram at underscore the coach key underscore the coach key I, I think it's yeah i think it's the coach key and then you can find me on facebook at K kfs smith kfs smith that's my initial so killing francis smith kfs smith um and then i don't really have a twitter right now but uh you can also check out my website the coach the coach key.com or coach key.com man i have some stuff i gotta look it up but at the end of the day look me up on instagram underscore coach key um, and then my website the coach key.com and yeah, man, that's that's my plugs, man. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your time. There you have it, y'all. All right. That wraps up another edition of the Millennial Gents Podcast, y'all. Make sure y'all stay tuned. Make sure y'all like and subscribe to the YouTube channels. Make sure you follow us on Instagram. Stay blessed. Stay gemmed up. We out of here. Peace.